Here I am in Las Vegas. Lost wages. Lost wages. Now, how long have you been there now? My goodness. I think I've been living here now for like 26 years. Wow. Yeah, that seems a right. A very long amount of time. And still, in a, um, in a kind of real way, don't see myself as a Las Vegas person. Yeah. Uh, I think that's part of Las Vegas. Is it has the humility of New Jersey and L.A. in that no one really feels kind of um, this yippee, here we are, you know. And uh, I like that. Well, that... Hey, Phil, are you recording uh, on your garage band? As yeah. You did yesterday? Oh, wonderful. Okay. Oh, well... hear that tone? He was very, very offended that you questioned his knowledge of garage band. You know, he's... Oh, yeah, right, you know. So why uh... don't you lay down some funky beats for us there, uh, Phil, <laughs> and show <laughs> us how well you <laughs> understand garage <laughs> Boom, 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 <laughs> boom, boom, <laughs> Sure. Uh, I think that the, the secret of Vegas is that uh, you, your money can disappear uh, very quickly. Where else can a person arrive in a $20,000 car and leave in a $200,000 bus? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> at, at a perfect place for a magician. <laughs> Welcome to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show with your hosts, Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet. Phil and Ted's guest today is magician, TV star, self-proclaimed carny trash, and renaissance man, Penn Gillette, the speaking half of Penn and & Teller. And now, your sexy boomer hosts, Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet. Welcome to Phil & Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. I'm Ted Bonnet. And I'm Phil Proctor. Today, we have an indescribably delicious guest, the great Penn Gillette, the most generous and busy man in show business. And we are going to talk about a lot of different things and hopefully things you've never heard Penn say before, which is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> it's very true. And I'm happy to say that Penn and I have been friends for many, many years. But this is the first time that I've really had a chance to talk to him thanks to the pandemic. I guess that's one good thing, Ted. He's in his bunker mm -hmm. and actually w nobody's letting him out so he could talk to us. <laughs> How's your bunker? How are you doing? Well, I, I just opened the front door because I figured after three months I should let a little air in. Mm -hmm. Oof. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, indeed. Good to be remote. Yeah, and I, I'm a little bit disconcerted because it doesn't smell like me anymore. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. But other than that, you know, um, it's it's okay. I'll be happy when it's over. <laughs> We're really at a crossroads now where people think it's over. I've had enough, so it's over. Yeah. The virus doesn't think that. Nope. It ain't over till the fat lady dies. Yes. If you're struggling out there with the idea that this is going to go on for a while, perhaps we can lend a little levity to the subject, bring a little comfort and company to your bunker. So turn yourself on, sit back, and enjoy... Penn Gillette. Hooray! Hello. Hello. That was the introduction? Yeah, that's the that's introduction. That's it. That's it. Good, good. <laughs> yeah, no music under, like your podcast, you know, just, just bare bones. But Ted is a wonderful producer, and so you never know what's uh, what he's going to do with these raw tracks, as it were. Well, let me give you the word Nazi so you can just edit that in wherever you want. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's really appropriate. It fits anywhere you want today, right? So we had a, uh, we had a, uh, a guy on Fool Us yeah. who wanted to do, uh, as part of his magic trick, he wanted to have kind of as his thoughts what I would say while watching the trick. So as I was sitting there watching a guy do magic over the um, PA came my voice perfectly saying things that I had never said. Oh, wow. And what they had done was one of the people that uh, created Siri yeah. had taken, um, uh, put in my audio books and my, uh, uh, just loaded them in yep. and got a database of artificial intelligence that they could do deep fakes and have me say anything, right? Have you say anything you want, just type it in, Penn says it. And uh, they were very proud of this technology, as they should be, as sure. they should be. And then the guy came back afterwards and said, don't worry, I'm going to get rid of this. You know, this is, this is, this could be used immorally, we won't do it. And then he said, but by the way, would you like a copy? And I said, well, I could say anything I want 
just like that without <laughs> your technology. <laughs> and he said, uh, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. You could. Well, yeah, he obviously was suffering from a little bit of artificial intelligence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? exactly. So I can give you the word Nazi and then you can do whatever you want with it. Once you've got that, your set is complete. You can do a deep fake. Yes. Well, hey, you are a deep fake. I am. Very you know, deep but, fake. But the thing is, well, you know, what's, what's so interesting about your career, besides the fact that you have a, a, such an incredible career, Penn, from, you know, the first time we met, I, I think the first show that, that I saw was MoFo, the Psychic Gorilla Show. Yeah, well, yeah, we did we did that for many years, but yeah, yeah, but I did. You, we we saw it. I I saw it in L. A. Right at a, at a nice kind of an intimate venue. L. A. Stage you, Company, I bet. That's where it was, and then you took it to Broadway, or was it already on Broadway? Oh no, we, that was uh, you saw it way before Broadway. We had to go to step to off Broadway first, and then to Broadway. So you saw it uh, probably f three or four years oh. before we were on Broadway. Wow. And I, I don't know if you remember, but we did this thing, which um, uh, I thought was such a good idea. Yeah. In our program, we had a list of people we wanted to have see the show. Uh -huh. These are the list of people Penn and Teller would like to have see the show. And on that list were Samuel Beckett, yep. uh, Crispin Glover, yep. George Romero, sure. and... Oh. And Phil Phil Proctor was and on that me. list as well. Yeah, oh, really? uh, and oh. uh, the nice thing was it kind of worked. You know, we played L.A. That list was there, and afterwards someone said, "What? Why is that? Why is that? What, what's that list mean?" And we said, "Well, nothing more than these are people we'd like to have see the show." Nice. And uh, and they would say, "Well, you know, I know Crispin Glover. I'll have to tell him." We said, "Good." <laughs> and they, they ended up coming by. And it was amazing how many we checked off that list because Andy Warhol was on it, Lou Reed. Oh good And um, by the time we got to um, New York, we were just checking them off like crazy. It was pretty oh, nice. That's really fun. George Romero. Yeah. Yeah, yeah big, big hero of mine, one of my favorite directors. I was a zombie in Dawn of the Dead. You were not. I was. In my favorite movie. Monroeville Mall. Really? Were you, are you a Pittsburgh boy? No, New Yorker, but I was in a, uh, f my film class in New York. Uh, my teacher was a friend of George's, and we all went to shoot a documentary, Document of the Dead, about George's movie. Oh, I saw Document of the Dead. So I crewed on that, and because I had a car, <laughs> and I drove out to Pittsburgh, and we stayed at the Sheridan, which was this high-rise hotel in the middle of the parking lot of the Monroeville Mall. They had shot the film, and they had already made their money back on pre-sales, territorial pre-sales. So George said, hey, let's do a pie fight. And that's how all that happened, and uh, I, I got to be a zombie. Well, that's fabulous. You know, I, um, I met George Romero uh, too late to be in the movies, but my friends um, in the band NRBQ mm. are zombies in, uh, I think, Day of the Dead. And mm -hmm. I have a little piece of the mall. When they uh, tore down part of the mall, somebody who liked Penn and Teller copped a uh, little <laughs> piece of the um, the uh, uh, construction material yeah. that and uh, uh, gave it to me. And uh, Dawn of the Dead, I I just it, there was a time when if you showed naked breasts and you had um, uh, horror you could make any movie you wanted. And so a lot of the high art was being done in, uh, in a very low form because people were just let go. And although um, George Romero didn't do the sex stuff much, he certainly delivered on the horror. So they yes. left. Plus the fact George Romero was six foot seven yep. and had a ponytail. So we were immediately, <laughs> um, we were immediately simpatico. He was a lovely man. Yeah, just just the greatest. Uh, when he did um, uh, when the Land of the Dead, his last movie um, mm -hmm. debuted in Vegas, and uh, uh, he uh, it was debuting at the film festival here in Vegas right while I had a show, uh -huh. and uh, I uh, I knew George just a little tiny bit, but I called him up and said I, I can't believe that you're working. When I'm working, this is this is just terrible. And he said to me, uh, you know, uh, in the afternoon, 
I have to make sure the theater is set and the sound is right. <laughs> and would you do me a huge favor and come in with all your friends and just loan me your eyes and ears to oh, be able to do that? How and perfect. I just, I, I basically burst into tears oh. and called up all my friends and said, we're going to see the new Romero movie with Romero. In the oh, afternoon, man. it was just it was just wonderful, wonderful thing. I of course I knew his father Caesar Romero, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, and and also you just shocked me a little bit because you said that uh, uh, you got a piece of them all when you yeah. say the zombies. I said, oh my God, he got a piece of all the zombies. You yeah. know, that, that'd be pretty <laughs> every good. Every one of them. Every one that's, of them. That's the kind of thing that Harry Anderson would have actually done, right? Harry, God bless him. Uh, you you knew Harry? I'm yes, sure of course I did. Of course I did. Of course. Yeah. Well, Harry was the only man I've ever known, or maybe except for you, who had two electric chairs I had in one. his house. I have one, and I then gave it to a museum. You did have one. <laughs> I had one uh, one actual one, and then uh, my daughter. We did a uh, we did a thing of uh, Volterra, which is yeah. an old uh, old act from the Carney where you run uh, high voltage, low wattage through someone's body and they can light Ooh. up torches and stuff like that. Ooh. So I had an electric chair built for my daughter. And when my daughter was 12, she was on, um, she was on uh, Fool Us with electricity running through her. Wow. And uh, her, uh, you know, and is, is, you know, it's, it's safe, theoretically. Yeah. But her classmates <laughs> and teachers were still a little appalled that she was going to have... Um, have this voltage run through her, and she she lit a torch off her fingers. That then I did Whoa. fire reading. It was wow. a father and daughter act. <laughs> not, not not every father can say that he built an electric chair for his daughter. The, the you you <laughs> when 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 we met you. All right, I should give a background for people who don't know. Uh, I'm a member of the Firesign Theater, and I toured with Peter Bergman, who mm -hmm. was kind of the founding member as Proctor and Bergman for many years, because we wanted to get out and see the people and find out what was going on in the world at the time. Uh, bad mistake. We should have stayed at home. But anyway, uh, and, and this, this tall kid used to show up after our shows in the Midwest, was it? Penn, well, I, I saw Coast. you, I think I saw you first at the cellar door in D.C. In D.C., yeah. And then you were in Chicago. You okay. got some really stupid rooting done because I, you were traveling in some sort of superstar mode, but I was hitchhiking, <laughs> so ah. I barely made your Chicago show, but oh. I did make it. And uh, then I saw one or two more probably, you know, uh, in the rooting after that, but I saw four or five shows in a wow. row. I was hitchhiking between them and uh, did not meet you till show three yep. or show four when you finally uh, saw me. Acknowledge you. Uh, there, was one, you. there was one show that um, I, would, I did performance art at. Uh, the, you were doing a show that started at uh, eight in the evening. Uh-huh. And at nine in the morning, I went to the uh, ticket booth and stood in line with my friend. And the ticket people said, what are you doing? And I said, well, my friends who are going to see the Stones and the Grateful Dead, they have to show up 12 hours before the show <laughs> to get in line. And I like Procter and Bergman as much as they like the Stones, so I'm going to stand here in line. So you came in for sound check, and there was a line of two people. <laughs> that had been there for five hours, standing in line, oh comfortably God. waiting. We already had our tickets. So oh. we were just waiting in line as performance art. And uh, that led to you saying, well, why don't you talk to us after the show? And um, you were the first person. Well, that's not true. The first person I met in show business was me. And yeah. then the second person I met in show business, I think, was you. I was just amazed <laughs> that someone who had actually been on stage was going to talk to me. Oh, that's that's just sweet. Wait, what year was this? 70... Well, this would have been seventy four. Yeah, 70... about that when we, when we uh, yeah. were on the road. Because yeah. I got, got out of notice. I don't say graduated. I got out of high school in seventy three. Right. So uh, I would have been, and then I went immediately. I lived for two years just on the road, on the streets, hitchhiking, hopping trains, and so on. And um, that would that would have been the time that I would have seen uh, Procter and Bergman. Yeah. So at that time, Penn, you, you actually didn't have any employment? Uh, were you doing magic no. on the street uh, or anything? I was doing mostly juggling. 
Yeah, juggling, and right. uh, I was, um, uh, you know, hitchhiking, so there were no expenses. Got it. And in a very odd way, you know, um, most people you think of as uh, hippies living on the street in the yeah. early 70s, you would think were in some way alienated from their parents. I was very close to my parents, oh. where it was my whole life, and every single day I called my mom and dad. Did you have any idea when you started, I guess it was when you met Teller and uh, and, and another partner whose name I yeah, can't pronounce. Yeah, we're, we're, we're Chris Maria. Right. Uh, I guess that you, you felt, well, hey, we got something going here. But did you have any idea how what an incredible, successful, and varied career you would be able to, to have? You know, if you talk to, um, to Howard Stern or Madonna... Yeah or you yeah. read about Houdini, or you listen to Paul McCartney talk, they will all say rather openly that they were not as famous as they should have been. Hmm. Paul McCartney says over and over that the Beatles were not given the credit they deserved. Um, Houdini, uh, you know, who will probably end up being the most famous entertainer of the 20th century, will probably eclipse Elvis. Um, uh, because, you know, he's in the dictionary, to pull a Houdini, it's, it's a verb. They would all say that. There's that kind of ambition. And uh, Teller and I are the opposite. I mean, Teller and I, our goal was to be carny trash. I mean, we wanted <laughs> yeah. to, all the stuff people make fun of in show business, you know, mall openings, cruise ships, uh, carnivals, that was our goal. And our heroes were people who had worked in show business for 50 years, completely unknown. And we had, uh, we romanticized that. So we put together our show that ended up going off Broadway and Broadway. Yeah. It was a hobby. Uh, as I said, my father was a jail guard. Teller's father was a commercial artist. And by the time we were, um, uh, been working together a year, we were making as much money as our dads had been oh, at wow. this low level of show business. So we had made our success. We were done. And uh, <laughs> um, when we first hit Off-Broadway and we were in Rolling Stone and People Magazine and on Saturday Night Live and Letterman yeah. and uh, everything else, we had all these interviews where I tried so hard to be gracious, but people would say to me, um, well, you know, you were, uh, uh, you were just poor and struggling and doing terrible and now you've made this your dream has come true and I would just say well with all due respect this was never my dream I never I never wanted to be on Broadway you know I never wanted to be in Las Vegas I never wanted to uh, have a, a full evening show uh, never had any of those desires I just was so amazed you know, my, my mom and dad had never met anybody working in show business. When I told my dad I, I want to do shows, my dad actually said, y you think you're Johnny Carson? Huh. And I said, no, there are other people in show business that you've never heard of. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, there's writers and I, I want to just, I want to juggle, I want to do anything. Yeah. And there's no understanding in my family. And so when I started doing shows, which I started doing in high school, I started doing juggling shows and doing magic shows. Uh, I had never met, I mean, Teller grew up in Center City, Philadelphia. So yeah. Teller was an intern on theater shows and had done lights and had, had, had done PA stuff and had been in the theater scene. I had no idea. I had no idea how, I remember once I'd done a college gig and I was standing on stage. One of the college students was setting lights for me. And he said, um, move a little bit upstage. And I just froze. No idea what those words meant. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I moved towards him. And he said, no, no. I said upstage. And I went, oh, yes. Oh, yes. You know. And... Uh, so I had, you know, I, I had no idea, you know, Teller and I uh, completely jury rigged everything we did and yeah. just put together yeah. what we wanted, what we wanted to do. So to tie this back in, when I, um, when I went backstage yeah. to meet you and Peter Bergman and saw people sitting who'd been on stage, it was without any exaggeration, 
the first time I'd ever experienced backstage at a, at a performance. And I was so envious of girlfriends I had who were groupies. Because at least they got to see what the lighting setup looked like. You know, what I'd never seen a green room. You know, nothing. And you know, you were you 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 were you you were not playing, you know, Radio City. You were in a you know, you were in a, a little rock club. Yeah, but a still club. seeing that uh, green room backstage with, with couches and potato chips was just <laughs> like, Oh, th- th- this is a way you can live. And at that point, you know, and for for you know, for ten years after, uh, the um the trajectory was, wow, I'm doing, you know, when I was doing street shows and um, I was very successful as a street performer. I'll bet you. And uh, I was, uh, I believe when I talked to other people who were around then, I was making, um, I was making incredible money. Wow. And it was all cash. So uh, the whole idea of the struggling thing was very strange because although I wasn't in a traditional trajectory, uh, if you're if you're 19 and you're working fares and you have no one you're supporting and uh, you're making uh, hundreds and once in a while a thousand dollars a week and it's the 70s, you're doing better than all your friends. And I went to an accountant and I said, um, I think I'm supposed to pay taxes on this. Yeah. And he said, uh, I said, I, I, I juggle on the streets. I juggle and do magic on the streets. And I um, play pretty classy areas and I make pretty good money. And I told him how much I made. And I said, how do I report that on my taxes? And he said, if someone who looks like you reports that much on your taxes, they're going to assume you're a drug dealer and there's going to oh. be trouble. And he said, and oh, by the way, I think you're a drug dealer. <laughs> 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 so he said, just don't ever mention it. And I'm always a little apprehensive about telling this story because I'm afraid an IRS guy is going to show up and go, wait a minute, in 75, you were making five grand a week on the street in cash? And I'm going to say, well, you know, I get lucky once in a while. <laughs> well, that was the thing, you know, Teller and I were doing street performing in carnivals and we would go buy a car in cash. I mean, we were strippers. You know, our money, our money was all cash. You know, we would have one dollar bills that we'd band together and would fill trunks and then you'd show up. You know, it was always funny. I went with a um, I was dating a uh, a stripper in uh, Vegas because, you know, you got to. And yeah. <laughs> um, we went to buy her her computer. And uh, there we were at the uh, at the at the computer store with you know uh, twenty five hundred dollars in ones that she was you know <laughs> and that to me if you're not paying your bills in ones you're not in show business <laughs> this whole idea of Hollywood where you get up you know when I we worked with Spielberg on something. Yeah. And I said, I just don't understand how you get up at 5 a.m. and say you're in fucking show business. You're an idiot. <laughs> you know, the reason we get into show business is to get up at about 11, 11. maybe yeah. 12, Sleep have late. a cup of coffee, yeah. and you get to sound check at about 3 or 4. Yeah. What is this thing you're <laughs> calling show business? You're listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show with our special guest, Penn Gillette. We'll be right back. I like the pump. I like the spray. The pump. The spray. The pump. The spray. Hey, hero, you got the right to own them both. So here it is at the Saturday Night Gun Mart. A double barreled over and under pump spray, fully automatic, semi automatic. It's a famous brand name. I can't mention it. I can't read it. I think it's from Czechoslovakia. Just want to wound him in the hand? We got a full assortment of handguns. Easy credit, never a hold up at the cashiers at Saturday Night Gun Mart, where you are the target. You're listening to the Phil and Ted Sexy Boomer Show. And before we continue our conversation with Penn Gillette, uh, we want to tell you that there are ways for you to communicate with us and catch up on what's going on with the show and who's coming on next. And what is that exactly, Ted? Well, that's the Facebook page, Phil. It's called Sexy Boomer Show. In your Facebook. In your Facebook and Twitter, hashtag Sexy Boomer Show. Please come to our website, which is uh, sexyboomershow.com. 
where you'll be able to hear other episodes. So back to Penn. Yeah. The carnival thing, it sounds like you have uh, an interest in sort of the underbelly of show business. Well, sure. I mean, I yeah. am the underbelly of show business. That's right. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm a fire eater. I was a sword swallower. I am absolute, complete carny trash. When you, when you were juggling on the street and everything, did you develop your patter from that? Oh, yeah. It, it, it developed very much. I was a, uh, when I was a juggler in high school, we yeah. would do these shows for like $10. And I was working with Mike Motion, who ended up being the uh, greatest juggler of the 20th Ooh. century, MacArthur Genius Grant, who lived next door to me. We learned to juggle together. Wow. And we would go out. We were called the toss-ups. And the, uh, <laughs> the, first, the first line of the show was, good evening, we're the toss-ups. We're going to call ourselves the throw-ups. But yeah, we settled right. on the toss-ups. <laughs> and uh, I was, you know, 14 and uh, doing my show. And we discovered that... Um, I would say little things between the juggling tricks, and as the things I said between the juggling tricks got longer, we got more successful. So by the time I was working the streets juggling, I was doing uh, 12 minutes, but of that 12 minutes, five minutes was gathering money, right? <laughs> and yeah. three minutes was gathering the crowd, and another four minutes was talking, and we squeezed in about three minutes of juggling in there. You know, oh, man. Uh, but I was um, what I was mostly was loud. You know, I could work yeah, outdoors yeah. for five hundred people mm -hmm. without any microphones, and that's when I ended up. You know, I was drinking chloroseptic. I ended up destroying my whole uh, my whole throat, and that was actually had it not been for coughing up blood every morning, Whoa. I would have probably stayed a street performer. But my voice, you know, um, uh, the, the kind of Tom Waits and Bruce Springsteen damage you hear yep. is a kind of um, surface damage. But my vocal cords are actually scarred all the way across. You know, oh, it's just, goodness. they're kind of leather. Whenever I go into my voice doctor, he, he takes pictures. And says, you know, we, we we've got to show people this because those, you know, the the uh, the the lips in there are just white scar tissue. They're not even pink anymore. So how did that happen? If you're from New England, and your father has given you an incredible work ethic, and you've decided to work on the street, and you can't talk, you find a way to keep talking, and uh, then you do permanent damage. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Harry Nielsen. It happened to Harry Nielsen. Sure. With a screaming right. contest with John Lennon. That's exactly right. You know, and what a sweetheart he was. Did you ever cross paths with I him? I never met I never met Harry oh, Nielsen. Man. He was he was a bank teller before he, he hit, you know. Uh, we knew him in Hollywood and anyway, it's a sad story really because yeah. he, he 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 was not as full, as recognized or fulfilled as he should have been in his career. No, he wasn't. He wasn't at all. As a speaking half of the Penn & Teller performance, it's interesting to hear you say this because you really have to be a great communicator to carry the load for both of you. Well, I, I don't. I mean, Teller does... Teller does a great all the you know all the communicating he needs to. But what's yeah. really funny uh, that uh, you know Teller's seven years older than me. Yeah. So uh, that when I started working with Teller, I was eighteen. So 18 to 25 is a very big spread. 65 oh, yeah. to 72 is the same age, you know. But um, uh, Teller is very well educated. Uh, Teller was a classics uh, scholar at, um, at, uh, at Amherst College in Western Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so I was completely uneducated. And Teller was um, very well educated. And Teller's very well spoken, very erudite, and uh, does lectures and does speaking and all sorts of stuff. But he's, he was fascinated by the idea of, um, of uh, uh, telling a story and communicating and lying without, uh, without speaking. And he also <laughs> hated... Hated Patter in Magic until he met me, because Patter in Magic is often I have here a ball in my hand and you state the obvious, and we try very hard not to do that in our show. Yeah. Well, I heard him speak in the show Magic and Mystery Tour back in two thousand three, and when you were in Shadapur. Yeah, yeah. And when you were back at the hotel, he would. I think it was actually the Egyptian show. He was so eloquent about yeah. what he was experiencing. 
And I saw that show as part of preparing for our conversation. And I was just taken by the depth and the fascination of going into these cultures. It really was like a, a pre-Bourdain approach. Yeah, it was, it was amazing because uh, I, uh, I, had been, uh, I had been to England, but I'd really never been out of the country. And this show uh, took us mm. to Egypt, uh, China, and India. And I have to be very careful in talking about this because this happened in 2000. And I have to say it happened in 2000 because all of these countries have changed so tremendously that yes. it, can be, um, it can be very tone deaf to describe these countries as if it was the way they were now, because they are not. But at the time we went to Shadapur, Shadapur was a, uh, was a slum off, um, off uh, New Delhi, and mm. the untouchables, now the caste system is, they're, they're working very hard to get rid of that, but they were still untouchables, which included magicians, um, <laughs> were, the, were the lowest of the low. And we were in a place that um, uh, we were told by one of the people that was showing us around, you know, most people, um, your, your hippies and your people looking for enlightenment who go to India, uh, go uh, as rich as rich Americans. And to an ashram. We were, we were trying to meet the magicians that actually didn't work for tourists, but worked for the real people. And that put us in a place where, as one of the people who showed us through, you know, your nightmares will never be the same. And uh, it, was, uh, it, it was incredible. It was intense. It was so, just on the show, it was intense. Well, and that was after we did a lot of editing to make it look as good as possible. We were really in, um, you know, Sally Struthers area. If you want to be a little cynical about the yeah. about the those those late night commercials, uh, and it was really it was really remarkable. Uh, one of the most amazing things about that show was uh, in China, we would see someone doing a piece of magic that they had invented, and we knew they had invented, and we would ask them. Uh, where does this come from? And they would say, it's hundreds of years old. It hasn't been changed. We've just learned it. And the, and the contrast, you know, an American magician, if he thinks he can get away with it, he will tell you that he invented playing cards. <laughs> I don't know what it was. I was just sitting around with some friends. We were drinking. We said, how about hearts, spades, diamonds, and clubs? What the fuck? And then my buddy said, what about royalty? And then I said, how about kings, jacks, and queens? And they said, that's a great idea, Bob. Let's do that. And then we said, we'll print them on cards like this, and then we'll invent gambling. That's the way it came about. That's what an American will tell you. <laughs> You see, a, uh, you see a Chinese magician, and you see him with a piece of polyester and, 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 and equipment that he clearly made and cobbled together. And you'd say, oh, this is venerated. This goes back 500, 600 years. This goes back. Magicians have always done this. And that was one of the differences in the culture that was, was so amazing. You know, Americans really want credit for everything, and the uh, Chinese <laughs> wanted credit to the culture for everything, you know? Oh, that's the, very uh, nice, yeah. The individualism, you know, this. Yeah. I thought one of the really pithy lines in that, you were referring to Shatterpour, and you said, like, Vegas, it's still a magician's town. <laughs> I was talking to a friend of mine who's a magician in preparation to speak with you, and I asked him about, are magicians cynical? And he said, no, more skeptical. Because you're basically, you're creating an illusion. Yeah. And it's not that you're putting one over someone, you're sharing a marvelous experience with someone. Hmm. Uh, you can look at two schools of thought in magic. There are, and this goes back to the book, The Discovery of Witchcraft in the 15th century, which is the first magic book written, uh, which deals with magic as trickery. Um, there's, a, there's a clear two roots. And one route is those who get into magic because they are interested in the idea of magic as a supernatural force. And their job is to recreate that kind of thing. So uh, I, I will try very hard not to misrepresent David Blaine, who was a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I believe I'm representing him properly, but we could not be more in disagreement. <laughs> he believes 
that when someone leaves a magic show, they should have false information about their world. He tries very hard to make sure that his lies are complete. Mm. So that you, having seen David Blaine, believe that things are true about the world that David Blaine knows or not. That is actually his goal. Mm. And there is a whole school of magicians that believe that. And I... Uh, I, I believe, and I'll, I'll, I believe that's immoral. I believe that is hack, and I believe that is inartistic, because uh, you are either lying, or people think you're mentally ill, or you are uh, you are playing this silly game that people just think you're you know you're jacking around. Whereas the other school of magic, which is you know um, uh, discovery of witchcraft, uh, Harry Houdini and Amazing Randy is the idea that um, what you're dealing with in magic is what I believe is one of the most important uh, things a human being can deal with, which is how do we ascertain truth? And there are very few places that you have a discussion of that. Uh, Poetry speaks to truth, music speaks to truth, but not in how you determine what's true. Magic is uh, kind of alone, uh, even outside of music and drama, in determining that. When you're watching Shakespeare, uh, the question is not what is real and what's not in that stage. You can talk about that abstractly, but not concretely. But um, magic allows you to uh, deal with epistemology playfully. Uh, you deal with the biggest taboo in society. There are societies we can find where um, cannibalism and murder are not taboo, but we can't find a society where lying to your own tribe member is not taboo. Uh-huh. Uh, it's the deepest taboo you can have, and yet magicians deal with it playfully. So to me, uh, when you say this is real, you've taken the most powerful aspect of uh of your art form and pissed it away uh Hmm. thrown it away it's one of the reasons that uh so much magic is so terrible (laughs) is that once you've done something that violates the rules of the universe you get a certain reaction from the audience and there can be a temptation to not go any further (laughs) Mm, yeah right um uh and uh uh with magic i believe when you say, uh, we know that what we're doing is not true, and you know that as well, but look at the ways this can appear true to you. You have a fascinating, um, uh, automatically emotional and even political statement uh, you're making. Uh, the idea would be if carny trash like Penn and Teller can distort what you're believing here in this theater in real time, Mm. what can malicious people with unlimited budgets hiding behind the scenes do? It automatically becomes that question. So um, uh, one of the things that kind of troubles me about the discussion of, um, of scams in terms of magic is you run this mistake that, that Mamet makes. I mean, Mamet is a brilliant writer And when he writes about cons, it's absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. But he gives the false impression that the uh, people who are running these cons are skillful. I mean, let's take Three Card Monty on the street. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, there's a lot of magicians who will talk about, here's the technique you use. You know, you're showing the two cards like this. You throw this. You bend the corner. Um, Everybody that's learned a little bit of magic gets fascinated by Three Card Monty. And they will tell you. This this is the way it's this is the way it works. This is the way it's done. And you have a a shill who's pretending to win, mm-hmm. and you end up with this um, admiration for the skill. That's right. That's that's not what happens. The, uh, a three card Monty team is not two people. A three card Monty team is usually six to eight people. Wow. There are lookouts all over, and if and this is a big if, if you were able to see through their scam, which you can't. 
and if you were able to supposedly win, or, and this is even more important, if you were to bet $20, but they saw that in your wallet or billfold you had 150 they just grab you, take you into an alley, and beat you senseless. <laughs> they just rob you. Uh, all the cleverness we talk about is a complete lie. When we talk about these clever little talking scams that are done by um, uh, certain Romanians who self-identify as gypsies, it's very hard to talk about this without being uh. racist. But there are groups of people yeah. who are criminals who are unfairly called gypsies. Um, True. But that group... Uh, you think about, oh, this is a clever little wording thing that they're doing and they're playing upon the, the con. Really, they're dealing with elderly people, many of whom are phenomenally lonely, many of whom are suffering from... Um, uh, uh, dementia? Uh, dementia or, or, or di different kinds of agency difficulties right. that they are then exploiting and robbing. So my argument with Mamet is he's using this fantasy to make very, very important points. But we've ended up with a kind of, uh, with all the, the con game movies and all the, um, all the uh, 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 heist movies, we've ended up with this kind of um, glorification of, it's a little like saying, you know, I have this friend who's really good sexually with women. Oh, by the way, he's a rapist. Now, that part that is rapist is a really important part. It negates everything you say before. Mm -hmm. So when you say there's this person who's really good at card cheating games, he's really good with cards, you then say, plus, he's a criminal. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that means that even if his clever little scam doesn't work, he's going to rob you in another way. And that's one of the, there's a stage that almost everyone goes through in magic where they kind of go, wow, wouldn't it be great to do this stuff for real? And that's when they when they fall in love with the con game. But um, I've met these people and they are not good people. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like saying the pickpocket. You know, they do the pickpocket, mm -hmm. they grab, they hand it off to someone else who hands it off to someone else. It's brilliant. It's choreographed. It's so fast. Well, yeah, compared to some <laughs> other criminals, not compared to the Olympic relay team. <laughs> you know, it's like saying these computer hackers are brilliant. They're able to break into these computers and you go, yeah, yeah. but not compared to the Bell Labs guys who, um, who developed, uh, who wrote the code and put right. the whole thing together. The idea, the defining term is criminal. The defining term is not brilliant. And I think that's so important to say. Man, that's, that's great. That's great. And that's where you have this sort of shady association sometimes with magic. How you manipulate perception is a tradecraft. Yeah, but the, the thing about that is that um, you are doing uh, that perception with consent. And I'm going to, I, I mean, I, I realize it's a little bit distasteful, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep coming back to, a, to, a, to an almost sexual thing. We are doing something that is very, very invasive. And we are doing that with complete consent, which makes it beautiful. The second you take away that consent, it becomes the ugliest thing possible. And hmm. uh, uh, it, 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 it may be a little bit um, uh, callous to do those two comparisons, but consent whether it's sexual or whether it's artistic, uh, is tremendously important, whether it's financial. So when you come to the Penn and Teller Theater, we have said to you clearly, we are going to lie to you. And you have given us consent right. mm -hmm. to do that. But I am also promising you that when you leave the theater, you will not believe anything that I know not to be true. And that is an incredibly difficult high bar. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a high bar that uh, I struggle with all the time mm. because uh, there's certain tricks with mentalism, you know, supposed mind reading, yeah. where you want to go with something else. You want to go with, you're giving me psychological uh, cues. That's also not true. Mm -hmm. There's tremendous memorization involved. 
That's mm. also not true. It's a trick. And presenting those things completely is trick all the way through. I try to use the, um, the sawing in half principle, which is when you go to see a, a magic show and you see a human being sawn in half, unless you are young without supervision or you are uh, mentally ill, uh, you do not believe you've witnessed a murder. And I believe that that's the way you need to leave every magic show. You cannot believe in a mentalism trick that you've seen some sort of psychological thing. I've seen so many magicians who think they're moral by saying, I'm not going to read your mind, but there are certain psychological profiling things to how you move your hands that can let me see whether you're lying or telling the truth. No, you did a... A card force, you stupid motherfucker. And I know that. And you've got to, in some way, when we leave the theater, we've got to know. Uh, we don't want to leave the theater thinking there's some sort of psychological way to tell if someone's lying. That's never been established. So we don't want to leave the theater thinking that. It's it's the square up. It's what? The, what they call the square up. Yeah. In the carny world. Yeah. To go one more time back to Shadowpour, the violence of that of the magic and the cutting of the children. Oh yeah, I mean it's really difficult to watch. Of course, oh. we all there, there's a square up. We know the kid wasn't hurt. I think, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe not physically. Yeah, it was very unsettling. Uh, even the suggestion of what was being done. The reason I'm going there, I'm taking this to a higher place. Mm -hmm. You live in a city that is built on illusion in the desert. Yeah, and now we're all living in a country that is sort of consumed by illusion and <laughs> in many ways dysfunctional. And, you know, people consider our current president a con. Yeah, except um, uh, he may be an eye shut con, which may not make any difference. Mm -hmm. But I, I think he is an eye shut and not an eye open con. I don't believe, knowing Trump as I do, yeah. uh, I believe he is um, uh, so deeply self-deluded that he, uh, there's a great book by a, by a philosopher, I forget his first name, named Frankfurt, called uh, On Bullshit. Hmm. And his point about bullshit is fascinating. That bullshit is not a lie. Bullshit is disregard for the truth, which is a deeper thing. Yes. When you're bullshitting, when you're saying whatever pops into your head, you are not deciding when to lie. You are not even trying to ascertain what the truth is to go against it. You are simply saying what you want to be true in any given moment. And that is different from a con. Mm. And uh, I believe that's what we're going, going with. But I think at, a, at, at an even deeper level than Trump, we go back to uh, Procter & Bergman, uh, one man, one channel. Um, we thought there was a utopian idea at moving the gatekeepers away. But now we have things happening like Antifa and Boogaloo which don't exist. They do not exist. Uh, there is no organization. There is no set of rules. Right. Anyone who wants to say they're Antifa, whether they be left wing or right wing, just states it and writes whatever they want, and it goes into our space. And then someone else can quote it. I mean, we do know that many of the threats that Antifa are going to show up have now been shown to be sent by right-wingers mm -hmm. that were then repeated by left-wingers. We also know that the Boogaloo, you know, Civil War II, Electric Boogaloo, mm -hmm. uh, which is starting a race war, that, um, that that's just uh, on TikTok, that's dance moves and mm. things. So I believed, you know, I spoke at MIT and I believe very strongly in the 90s that um, when we opened up these channels of communication, we were going to see this wonderful, wonderful, true democracy. And uh, we ended up being wrong because what we found out was that people wanted to jack off to outrage. And when you're jacking off to outrage, you'll get more and more outrage. And the problem is that if you sit down with someone that you identify as a right winger and someone you identify as a left winger and they're not on the Internet and they're not watching MSNBC or Fox, but they're just talking and you say to them, OK, who in this room thinks that police officers should shoot uh, uh, African-Americans uh, willy-nilly. Anybody think that? Nobody does. 
Uh, who thinks that there should be anarchy and people should not be protected in any way from people around them? Anybody? The thing is that we are all agreeing and then distorting our own positions for the sexiness of outrage. And um, I think that the fact that we now have a president who became president not because of policies, which he did not have, and not because of empathy or charisma, which he does not have, but rather because he could grab attention better than anyone else. Uh, whether that attention be positive or negative, uh, he could keep outrage going. I mean, they now find that artificial intelligence on the internet suggesting things on YouTube and TikTok and everywhere else are able to lead people towards outrage. Um, we have to now learn to deal with that. I mean, for um, 100 million years, the biggest problem living things had was uh, was too few calories. That was the biggest problem, too few calories. And now for 50 years, for a small percentage of the world, uh, and only one species, except for pets, the problem becomes too many calories. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, there's nothing that evolution has, d has dealt us that lets us deal with that. And then the same thing with information. Um, 300 years ago, uh, 400 years ago, uh, the amount of information in one issue of the New York Times is the amount of information that a human being would have gotten in their entire lives. Mm. And now we have too much information and we have to decide how to, um, how to uh, give ourselves a healthy diet of that that allows us to actually think. You know, mm. I, mm. my... Uh, my, my mother-in-law watches MSNBC all day long. And we come to supper, and she says, here's what's happening in the news. And I say to her, is there a piece of information you're going to give me that makes me want to vote for Trump in November? And she says, no, absolutely not. I said, then we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I am sure that if there's a piece of information that my friends find out that means I should vote for Trump in November, they will give it to me post haste. <laughs> but until that piece of information comes, I don't need any more outrage. We're both parents of, of teenagers and we're trying to encourage them to do well. And Well, let me tell you right now, your daughter's watching porn, accept that, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than making it. <laughs> How do you reconcile with what, of course, we want for our children versus what's coming at us right now? Yeah. Uh, so um, um, uh, Z, my son Zoltan, is uh, 14, and Moxie, my daughter, is 15. And they have been um, stuck in the house with their uh, mother, father, and grandmother for months without going out. And it's a little like having two horses in your closet. Um <laughs> Uh, can you imagine being 14 and having no contact with anybody but your sibling, mother, father, and grandmother? It's uh, it's uh, one of the many things that's uh, that's that's so much harder for other people than it is for me during this time. Sure, sure. We have a 16-year-old daughter. She's hanging in, but it's uh, it's difficult. Yeah, I can't I can't imagine because when you're um, when you're that age, you know, you're, you're finding out who you are and you're trying on different personas and you're bouncing it off people and you're supposed to be able to bounce it off uh, peers uh, in a non-electronic way. And uh, so I don't, uh, I don't envy them their situation. Uh, I used to envy them a lot because the later you're born, the better world you're born into. But, uh, but this is quite a, uh, quite a little curve to be thrown. Mm -hmm. I try... Uh, to tell my children that um, we've been through very bad times before and uh, we have come through them. I try to tell them that um, this too shall pass, which is something my, my mother said constantly, along with uh, it's a great life if you don't weaken, which my mother also said all the time. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I, I try to pass that on. Um, I also try desperately to understand that they're better than me. Mm -hmm. um, I have so many peers that do these, what I consider to be dumb brags, 
which is, you know, my children, they listen to mostly Led Zeppelin and Beatles because that's the greatest music. And I go, what are you, fucking insane? Yeah, right. Um, there's obviously, when we're in the car, uh, I mean, no one you can see behind me. Um, I am obsessed, and Bob Dylan has been a guidepost in my heart and my brain for... Uh, really my entire sentient life. You know, I'm young enough that I was able to be listening to Bob Dylan when I was 12. But that's not their world. And my friends are surprised that my children don't know anything about Bob Dylan. But I know a little bit about Billie Eilish, you know, because when we're in the car, I want to hear their music. And that's my right. friend, my friend Mike Nesmith, um, formerly of the Monkees, uh, my friend Mike Nesmith uh, said to me, it was, it was mind-blowing. He said to me um, about video games. He said, do you play video games? And I said, no, no, no. I, I listen to music. And he said, well, you know, uh, people are always trying to look for the next kind of music. And the next kind of music is video games. He said, uh, you knew how to tell the Beatles from the Rolling Stones and your parents didn't. And uh, your children can tell World of Warcraft from, uh, from, uh, from you know, uh, Team Force 2 in ways that it's just guys running around with guns to you. Just like it's just long-haired guys from England, you know? That's all it was to your, your parents. It's the same thing. And video games, you, you don't know the creators. They know all their names. They know what's coming out, where it is, and you're just as oblivious. You're just the guy going, rock and roll has got to go, you know, smashing the record. And um, I said to my son, you know, it's so funny, you're interested in video games. When I was your age, it was all music. And my son said, but dad, that's only because there wasn't video games. If there were video games, you wouldn't have been listening to music. And I went, I think he's right. <laughs> you know, he now has uh, he now has a group of seven friends, and he, they're working on a video game. And one friend is doing the art, one friend is doing the music, one friend's doing the writing. Wow! My son's doing the programming. And I said to my son, "I'm, I'm so glad you're in a band." And he yeah. said, "He said it's, it's not a band." And I said, "Yes, yes it, is. it is." You know, my uh, my my friends, we got together in a garage, and I had you know I had my drums, and my friends said, "Okay, you got to learn the drum part to White Rabbit," and I had to go out and do that. You know, um, uh, just like you have to, we have to. He has to learn to program how they're swinging on vines. You know, uh, well. He's going to figure that out. So I think that uh, what I think about with the children is um, we definitely know that um, they are going to navigate the social space better than we are. You know, I remember, um, I don't know, I was on Bill Maher or something, you know, and he was talking about how we had to, um, not him, but one of the guests was talking about how we had to teach our children not to send sexual selfies because that would follow them forever. And my point was, within 25 years, 30 years, we're going to have someone on the Supreme Court whose pictures of whose breasts are available on the web. That's going to happen. 40% uh, of people under 25 admit to sending naked pictures of themselves onto the web to friends. Wow, 40%. Uh, yeah, it is now. Uh, I have a friend who's a uh, who's a very famous author, who said um, a tit flash is now hello. <laughs> um, uh, I know for a fact, for an absolute fact, if I were seventeen and in high school, I would have been sending. Uh, naked pictures of myself to my girlfriend and giving them in return. I think that is part of the process. It is exactly the same as when a generation discovered making out a drive-in movies. Mm. They discovered they discovered that good thing to do. And I think instead of warning our children of how they can be successful in our world, we should accept the fact that that world is going to change and that's going to be okay. We saw that with uh, with long hair and with tattoos. 
Um, parents were telling us, you know, cut your hair to get a decent job. Yeah. And what they didn't tell us was, oh, there'll be decent jobs that you could have long hair for. Because yeah. they didn't know that was going to happen. There was a time, remember, when... Uh, Maybe even people on this conversation were going, ooh, they've got a tattoo. They can never get a, a, a good job. If that's showing on their wrist, they'll never have a decent job. And now I defy you to find an active boardroom without mm. one person with a tattoo showing in the room. Mm -hmm. And that was not because we taught younger people not to get tattoos. <laughs> it was because the world changes. Now, I still don't have a tattoo, you know. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, you know, that someone 25, that isn't just an okay thing. And uh, I think for all that stuff, like uh, when people say, how are you telling your children how to use social media? I say, Is, isn't the question, how are my children telling me to use social media? That's right. Because my daughter gets sucked into these conspiracy things. You know, the, she knows that when she uses YouTube... She is going to be pulled to a white supremacist site, a flat earther site, a we didn't go to the moon site, a um, uh, any of these sites. She's going to hit that within an hour. And she knows. She said, I watched a flat earth thing. I love this stuff. I mean, it's not true, but I love it. That's not the way I deal with that shit. Right. You know, I was a skeptic. So it was like, what do you mean there's ESP? There's no such thing. My daughter's like, uh, oh, I saw this thing on ESP that it was totally fraudulent. It was really funny. We grew up in the 60s. Yes. I had an older sister. I observed the 60s as a preteen. It was difficult and scary then. And they have existential threats we didn't have, like the end of the world. Yeah, but you know, uh, I always try to point that out. You have to remember that social media... Uh, changes things uh, tremendously. I mean, uh, if you look at, you know, my, my, my dad, uh, who's also an old, you know, I, I'm, I'm an old father because I was 50 when my daughter was born. And um, my, my, my mom was 45 when I was born. So uh, my parents were, were old too. But my dad was looking at a world where uh, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, uh, Kent State, off the gold standard, Vietnam, and a president who was uh, demonstratively crazy mm -hmm. was happening simultaneously. And I think if we'd have had 24-hour news and uh, an iPhone uh, footage of those buses burning in Birmingham and of the attack dogs, uh, as opposed to having the four or five iconic images, if we had Kent State from 15 angles on phones, uh, I can't imagine. I mean, I, I do think we're still in a situation that's um, that's better, uh, less scary than than '68. But I was 13, so I, I I couldn't have perceived it. But I think about how that must have seemed to my to my father, you know, uh, who was a um, who was a jail guard. Uh, you know, oh. uh, lower middle class, uh, maybe middle class, and uh, living in a small town, it must have really seemed like the end of the world. And he must have fretted so much for my uh, my safety and had such such trouble understanding, mm -hmm. you know, why I was reading Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin and, you know, why uh, revolution for the hell of it seemed like a good idea. You know, that must have been so difficult. And I try... So hard when my uh, when my uh, friends, my peers are uh, going apoplectic over this to go, you know, um, we're still not as bad as uh, 1917. Of course, the fact that we have 1917, 1929 and 1968 all happening simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that adds up. <laughs> You're listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show with Penn Gillette of Penn & Teller. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. The lottery is the people. The people taking a last chance on themselves. So why shouldn't people just like you spend the next century stuffed with truffles like lucky tin can opener Juan LaFong? I won! Now I don't have to work on this finger-cutting machine no more. 
Or itch and sniff winner, Mrs. Manila Envelope. Finally, I can afford to pay someone to kill my husband. And the loser's money goes to our schools for embedding mental detectors in our kids and to our prisons so they can have Sadie Hawkins Day. Lottery luck. It's only a buck away. Triple ripoff, millennial snatch and lick. It's rolled over to $180 billion. Drawings at midnight, so if anybody still has a chance, it must be you. You're listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. To hear all the Sexy Boomer Show episodes and get your hands on our Sexy Boomer bumper sticker, visit SexyBoomerShow.com. Look for Sexy Boomer Show on Twitter and Facebook. Back to Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet and their special guest, magician and TV host, Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller. Well, we're back again and we're talking to Penn, the big half of Penn and Teller. And the talkative one, too. What's happening in Las Vegas right now? I mean, you have the biggest show in town. I am the least essential worker in the country. Uh, <laughs> there's there's the emergency room people. Then there's magicians way down here. Uh, <laughs> Vegas is doing um, very badly. You know, we are, we are not necessary. This is an entire, uh, I mean, along with Orlando uh, and along with the Vatican, you know, we're entirely driven by tourism. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so people are trying desperately to open up perhaps earlier than than, than I think we should. Uh, I think I, I'm very much for playing the long game. And uh, other people don't have that luxury. Right. You know, I have the uh, the money that I can uh, be, be safe and try to help others that can't. But uh, I don't know, you know, as my, my friend, Dr. Greger, who's a, an epidemiologist says, you know, you'll be able to do shows safely. When do you feel good about enticing people to do something that's dangerous? You know, a lot of these protests mm. uh, were finding out that outdoors with masks, they were probably pretty safe. But even if they weren't that safe, they're not going to be sick themselves. They're going to kill their grandparents. And... Um, that's the problem. The people who come to Vegas will be safe. We don't know what they're going to bring home with them. And uh, so, you know, um, I, I, am, I am the least expert to talk about this. I do know that um, there's starting to be a lot of action in the, in the, in the Strip, and uh, it scares me. And I hope, uh, like everybody, I hope I'm wrong. Well, listen, listen, you said that in Vegas, you don't know what they're going to bring back with them. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you really wanted to stay in Vegas that time. Yeah, right. <laughs> Leave it in Vegas. You know? <laughs> Please. <laughs> oh, dear. The long-term prospects, which are people are having trouble even conceptualizing uh, until we have a, a vaccine or some sort of treatment, uh, which will take, you know, historically takes a long time. Well, we don't want to go with historically because historically it's 10 years and 92% don't work. Oh, yeah, you're right. But uh, we're hoping this is, a, uh, this is a break in the historic uh, record. Well, we have biotech on our side and we have uh, 150 different enterprises at work because it's a, you know, it's a gold rush. And we also may have, uh, may have uh, human challenge studies, which is horrific, but we may have that, you know. If we can do human challenge. What is a human cha challenge? Is that like thinning the herd or something? No, human challenge is um, when you have a vaccine to see if it's going to work, you inject a zillion people and you send them out into the world and you do number crunching and you find out what percentage would take it. Human challenge means I give you the vaccine and then I shoot the virus up your nose. Uh, Sounds like people crunching to me. Yeah. And the uh, I was kind of going, well, we, we can't do that morally. And then my uh, my friend, Dr. Greger, said, if we're allowing people to work at grocery stores and do delivery and calling them heroes, someone who wants to be a hero with full consent, whatever that means, which means obviously not a prisoner, <laughs> But with absolute full consent and full knowledge, maybe only an MD would be allowed uh, to say, 
uh, I can speed up this process by eight months by taking the vaccine myself and then having the uh, virus shot up my nose, we might allow them, like uh, firemen running into burning buildings, to do it. And if you allow human challenge studies, you can chop off months, if not years. Right. The human challenge thing, the people who decide to do that, we're going to have to force them to think long and hard, and they're going to need a big battery of tests because we are, we are dealing with something that is... Uh, grossly immoral mm. uh, if if there's if there's if there's one eye not dotted what we've done is monstrous but a a someone who is complete complete consent you know we have historically we have had several doctors who have uh, who have experimented on themselves and uh, if they decide to do that it would be uh, it would be an amazing amazing thing and maybe we want to um, you know, there, there are super altruists. There are people that uh, yes. give kidneys to strangers. That happens. And we allow that. So if we're allowing super altruism, um, we can allow that, providing it's with full consent. Now, how, how many of, of these philosophies, uh, look, this is a silly question, but since we're talking about a political world, come out of your libertarian beliefs and also tellers. You're both libertarians, aren't you? We are both libertarians and uh, libertarianism is, is, is very complicated. And it I, is. Uh, I would be lying if I were to say that uh, a lot of what's happening uh, lately isn't shaking a lot of that, uh, a lot of that foundation. Um, my definition of libertarianism is perhaps a bit eccentric. It's to ask the question, could this be accomplished with more freedom instead of less? Uh -huh. And sometimes that answer is no. Uh -huh. And the pandemic is running an experiment where, uh, from the libertarian point of view, uh, do we allow uh, more experiments with drugs done with people with consent? And the anti-libertarian point of view is, uh, do we need a safety net that protects everyone. And of course, the big question is, um, is it, uh, you know, the, the standard thing said, that the, the, the right to swing my arms uh, uh, ends with your face. You know, uh, I, can't, I can't hurt someone else. And right now, we're in a situation where it is possible that going in a public place and breathing could be... Uh, could be a, a, an act of taking away someone else's freedom. You could be putting them on a ventilator. So uh, there's a libertarian point of view for if you're not wearing a mask, um, what you're doing is, is morally wrong. Because we know very much so that wearing a mask does not protect you very much. Right. It protects people around you. I did a little research, you know, um, the cultures, some of the Asian cultures, uh, have wearing a mask as a very, very natural thing. Yes. If you wake up with a scratchy throat, you put on a mask to go out and go to work, and it's a way of showing respect for the people around you. You're not protecting yourself, you're protecting others. And I wondered when that cultural shift happened, when that, when that split happened, that the United States didn't do that, and the Asian cultures did do that. And I thought it was probably SARS, it was probably late 20th century, I was just wrong. 1917, ah. uh, the, the, biggest, the, the biggest catastrophe that's ever hit the human race in history, 1917, the flu epidemic. And we uh, had more deaths of human beings than we've ever had anywhere in history. World War II isn't even a blip compared to the flu. And uh, there were mask laws in every country. And the United States was wearing masks. And then after that, for some reason, it went into the culture of Japan and China and did not go into the culture of the U.S. And it's so strange that um, that, that didn't catch on because, um, you know, my because of my parents' age, my mom was um, was five or six in, uh, in 1917. Um, and she never spoke of the flu, whereas I know from looking at the records that 
like everywhere in the world, Massachusetts uh, lost a huge number of people. She certainly had relatives that were lost, and they never spoke of it. And um, it was really strange because we have never seen, uh, before the 21st century, we've never seen Americans uh, not of Asian descent wearing masks in public in the United States. And that change has got to happen. And I don't know how we make it so that wearing a mask is seen as respect for the people around you and not an act of cowardice. Right. That little that little switch is amazing. You are not wearing a mask to protect yourself. You're wearing a mask so that the people around you's grandparents won't die. Sort of the notion of manifest destiny. I mean, when in our generation have we ever been denied our basic freedoms? Hmm. Yeah, that weighing of individual rights uh, versus collective rights is, um, is, uh, is, is a huge constant, constant uh, uh, calibration. I mean, your, your hardest core socialist and your hardest core libertarian are still making adjustments on both sides. You know, the, um, the, the socialists want individual freedom and libertarians want a safe society. Uh, when it comes down to it, you know, we all want the same things and none of us know how to get there. Yeah. But we're, we're struggling together, you know. I try to look at the bright side, what, what some positive outcomes will be in terms of our spiraling environmental issues, our dysfunctional political systems, our inequality of wealth. Do you think that Mother Nature is inadvertently putting a pause button, forcing us to reassess? Well, my... Uh, my uh... Friends in epidemiology say um, they're hoping this will prepare us for the um, for the bad one that's coming. Oh, geez! Because uh, factory farming, uh, you know, all ten thousand years ago, you don't have uh, colds, you don't have flu, you don't have any of those. All the infectious diseases are um, zoonotic; they all come from animals. Uh, uh, I think the common cold is cows, uh, uh, polio is sheep, uh, of course the flu is ducks, um, and all of these diseases live happily and without much damage in the animal populations for millions of years, and then, uh, you know, you get an opportunity for a horse to sneeze on you a zillion times. And now that we're um, killing um, 90 billion vertebrates a, a year, and we know that the uh, H1N5 flus are going to uh, are going to explode. They're going to be deadly. They're going to be worse than 1917. And we can deal with that. I mean, um, uh, stopping factory farming. You know, uh, we now see that corporations, who we always see as the enemy, and always turn out to be the friends. I mean, right now, uh, Tyson Meat Products is moving into vegan food faster than anybody. Uh, the dairy departments are filled with non-dairy uh, milks and non-dairy cheeses. I got almond milk right up there in my refrigerator right now. You know, there also might be clean meat, which is a other crazy thing, being able to create meat without animals, which allows, by the way, designer meat. You could have Tom Cruise because it doesn't matter what <laughs> cell you're building from. If you want a Tom Cruise steak, you could have it. I don't. So there will be there will be those changes. I mean, the um, climate change is uh, uh, undeniably past the tipping point. But uh, what we don't figure out, what we don't ever know, is technology. Uh, we do know that the uh, tin shortage uh, in the 50s was insurmountable, and then boom, we had aluminum. Yeah. Now, this one seems a lot harder, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, we're we're uh, we have to see what happens with uh, you know uh, changing changing the way we uh, the way we eat and the way we get power, and uh, also the way uh, maybe the way heat is uh, stored on Earth. I mean, we we may have to do something much much more uh, invasive, but. Um, you know, in the immediate picture, things look really bad. 
in the long term, things look really bad. <laughs> and there's this place in the middle that looks kind of okay that we hope we can solve the long term one during. I don't think we're beyond the tipping point yet because if you watch a televangelist, you know that if you put money in the box, there's a good chance you'll live you know, forever <laughs> or at least go to heaven. That's true. See? That's true. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> and why would they lie of about course, that? They have no motive. Course, no motive. Unless, they're, <laughs> unless it's magical thinking, which is a whole different way to think of magic, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we're just getting started with this one. Thank you so much. We've done three hours. We've got, what, another six to go? <laughs> it's a telethon. The tip! The tip! Just call into the numbers The numbers under your screen there. <laughs> Give some one of my kids. <laughs> Bye-bye. Wow, wasn't that something? What an interesting and uh, really lovely man. Generous man. So generous that we're going to continue this conversation in the next episode of Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, so stay tuned. Good idea. You've been listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, featuring Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet with special guest Penn Gillette. Saturday Night Gun Mart and Triple Ripoff were written and performed by the Firesign Theater. Music by Eddie Betos and the Nervous Brothers. I'm A. Ernest Guy. Join us for part two with Penn Gillette on the next episode of Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, produced by RadioPictures.com, the makers of fine podcasts for boomers. Okay? <laughs>